great to be here today in all this stormy, rainy weather, and safely. Nobody had any trouble, I don't think. And it looks like we're going to get a lot more rain this week. Well, uh, today I want to talk about something I guess I've talked about before, maybe a lot, but I don't know. The way our country is, I think we get used to it and we almost get accustomed to all the things that are wrong. And so here I go again. <laughs> Will America regain her greatness is what I'm talking about. <clears throat> I guess we all wonder that because we know we're pretty much in trouble. I think a lot of people know we're in trouble. Some deny it, probably. <clears throat> but we have many problems. I just listed a few. Again, you know, the massive government debt. We all, we all know that, and we wonder how long can that go on. And our failing education system. I think we all see these shows where they go out on the street with the little microphone and ask people, some of them even... Uh, teachers or even I think teachers or college students, high school students, ask them questions like what's the DC mean in Washington DC or who did we gain our independence from, who did we fight in the war of independence, what to, what nations bordered the United States and many times they don't know these things you know. So our education system definitely is not doing the job and we have rampant crime which we kind of get accustomed to and the, one of the newer things that we have now is cyber crime. I guess we've had that at least for a couple of decades where they can steal your identity over the internet and be in another country and, you know, take over your identity, raid your bank accounts, whatever. And now we have what's called a war on police by certain segments of society. They actually go out and, and, and uh, try to ambush police and do ambush police. And I guess another kind of a new one on the scene is the sexual and gender confusion. That, uh, that is confusing. <laughs> People don't seem to know what gender they are or what bathroom to go to, but I know that there's not a lot of that, but they, you hear it in the news and it gets, gets everybody upset about it. And we've got the illegal aliens who overtax our hospitals, our welfare system, and our schools. And we find that our Constitution is sometimes ignored by our leaders when it's handy to do so. And we find Christian, Christian morality under attack. And I, I said Christian morality for, for certain because a lot of religions are not under attack, but Christianity is in our country and around the world too. And we hear that our military is weakened, and that's to name a few. And our country is deeply divided on how to address these problems and who will we choose to protect and defend our Constitution and our God-given right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And, of course, that deeply divided part really worries me because we don't, we don't need to become more divided than we are. <clears throat> and far as choosing wisely, uh, you know, in the Bible, I, I don't have the quote right here in front of me, but uh, I think we've all heard it. The fear of God is the very beginning of wisdom. And so we need more of that wisdom. And the fear is not abject fear. It's uh, a respectful fear, knowing that God holds our, our future, our lives in his hand. And if, you know, if we can't learn to live by, by God's rules, we're in trouble. Anyway, we have one candidate will say that, that uh, they will make America great again. Another says, well, America's already great. And I really doubt that, that they know how to make America great or what made America great in the first place. But I do think some of our founding fathers had it exactly right. And it, they, I think they knew what would make America great and what would sustain America. And oddly enough, it really wasn't the Constitution or the Bill of Rights that they gave us. And I'd just like to read quickly a few quotes that they said, and you'll see what they, what they knew was essential for us to stay uh, a strong and sovereign nation. 
Our first president, George Washington, said, it's the duty of all nations to acknowledge the providence of Almighty God and of all things to obey His will and to be grateful for His benefits and to humbly implore His protection and favor. I would like to hear that, something like that again. Uh, and John Adams, I think he, w he was the signer of the Constitution and I believe our second president. And he, he wrote, we have no government with the, power, with the power capable of contending with human passions unbridled by morality and religion. I would say Christian religion. Our Constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate to govern any other. And Thomas Jefferson, he was thought by many uh, modern people that, that he wasn't religious. They use him as a, to say, you know, they, they really didn't, wasn't that religious. They didn't really believe in, in God that much. But he wrote, can the liberties of a nation be thought secure when we have removed their only firm foundation, a conviction in the minds of the people that these liberties are of the gift of God, that they are not to be violated except with the wrath of God. Indeed, I tremble for my country when I reflect that God is just, that his justice cannot sleep forever. I'm not certain what he was thinking about in those times, maybe slavery. But I imagine if he was alive today, he would tremble even worse thinking about what's going on. And John Jay, another signer of the Constitution and the first Chief Justice, he wrote, The Bible is the best of all books, for it is the Word of God and teaches us the way to be happy in this world and in the next. Continue, therefore, to read it and to regulate your life by its precepts. That is... That is really profound. He also wrote, Providence has given to our people, I would add divine providence, has given to our people the choice of their rulers. And it is the duty, as well as the privilege and interest of our Christian nation, to select and prefer Christians for their, ruler, for their rulers. So I think these people knew what made America great and what would keep us great and keep us safe. I'm not sure our leaders today know that. But can we really blame our leaders for, for all the problems? After all, we've elected them over and over again, some of them. And uh, we should look for honest, God-fearing leaders, but do we? And we should live our lives according to God's word and law. I think many of us here would, could answer yes to those things, but I'm not sure enough people do. In Second Chronicles, we're all familiar with that, but uh, it's so appropriate and so uh, good that I went back to that again, it, where it says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, very important, humble ourselves, and pray and seek the face and seek my face and, tur and turn from their wicked ways. Then will I hear from heaven and forgive their sin and heal their land. And you know, that's two ways we get to know God, through prayer and seeking his face, face through the word of God. Uh, the word of God will re reveal a lot to us about the character of God and, and what his plans for us are and about his great love for us also. And I believe this is the only way America can return to greatness is to do what it says in 2 Chronicles 7, 14. And uh, maybe, I don't know if the country will ever do that in enough numbers, but we can do that. And, uh, and I think we do do that. And in closing, let's turn to Proverbs 29. I just wanted to read some, some things there. Proverbs 29, uh, verse 2. It says, When the righteous thrive, the people rejoice. When the wicked rule, the people groan. Well, that's true enough. Verse 4. By justice, a king gives a country stability. But one who is greedy for bribes tears it down. 
in the last verse. I'm going to read it. Here is uh, verse 18, same chapter, uh, Proverbs 29. It says, where there is no revelation, and I, <clears throat> I'm assuming that means revelation of God's word or preaching of his word, the people cast off restraint. In other words, we're restrained. Our, our human nature is restrained by the word of God and the teachings. But blessed is he who keeps the law. So thanks for your attention. Okay, the title of this message is, What is our reward and why will it be so fulfilling? Just kind of sub-questions about what is our reward and why it will be so fulfilling are questions like, where is God's kingdom? Yes, sir. Oh! <laughs> There's a, an alert person. Um, where is God's kingdom? Uh, thank you, Don. <laughs> um, in, in relations to what we're going to receive. Is it going to be heaven or earth? And, of course, when is it coming? And some more, a little bit more details on what our reward is. It's kind of like our reward. Where? Why? And I th hopefully, why will it be so fulfilling? Why will it be so fulfilling? I want to go to John 640. I know this is a big topic, so there are a lot of scriptures we can't cover, but we'll cover at least, I think, key things. John 640 uh, reads, and this, these are the words of Jesus himself. And this is the will of him who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Not that he's up in heaven, but he's in the, you know, resting in his grave, or however God does the spiritual sleep, he will raise him up. Verse 44. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. If you get the calling in this life and you respond to it with a yes, I mean, God isn't going to force anybody, but if you get the calling and you respond, you have an opportunity, I think, for all eternity to be closer to God and Jesus Christ, further up the pyramid if you want to view it that way, <clears throat> who draws me. And I will raise him up at the last day. Not the moment he passes away, but at the last day. Um, and only a small number are called now, so we're fortunate. Um, and it is hard to buck society, I understand. John 5.25, um, just over a little bit, um, Christ says, Most assuredly, I say to you, the hour is coming, and now is, when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God. You know, that last trump. And those who hear will live. They're not, they're not alive now, but all the great saints will hear it. And it's coming. What did, what did his disciples expect? You, those of you that are familiar with the New Testament know that often they would get together, and uh, like the sons of thunder, and say, Christ, would you guarantee that my two sons, you know, John, get to sit on your right hand and on your left hand, you know, the top two spots? What they expected was political power, and they jockey for the top spot. And you, that's in the New Testament, a number of places. And Christ told them they would receive it. But let's go to Acts 1 and see when they received that political power that they expected. Acts 1, verse 6 and 7. This is near the after Christ was resurrected and cutting close to the, his 40 days of being with his disciples before he ascended and, and maybe 10 or so days from Pentecost, he said in verse 6, Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? The kingdom is just what you think, a government that rules, you know, with absolute autocratic power. And, of course, they were going to get high positions in that government. And he said to them, uh, actually, he, out, he already told them they'll each be in charge of one of the tribes of Israel, and, and probably other powers go along with that. 
He said to them, It is not for you to know the times nor the seasons which the Father has put in his own authority. I'm going to move on down to verse 11. Who also said, men of Galilee, why do you, these are the angels as Christ descended up on a cloud. He just went up, up out of their sight. The angel said, why do you men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into the heaven? The same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will, will come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. In other words, he rode a cloud up into the heavens. He's going to come down in the air and the clouds. Actually, he's going to come back to roughly the same spot. They were there in the, we call it Zion, the mountain on which Jerusalem sits. That's where Christ is coming. And it's going to be dramatic. And we think he'll come, circle the earth, pick up all of his saints, almost like lightning. Everybody will see. It's not like he's going to sneak up and all the saints will be glowing. And However, it's going to be spectacular. Land on Zion and from then on take over this world. Give it the government this world desperately needs. Uh, so he's coming in the clouds to take over. 1 Thessalonians 4. Uh, in 1 Thessalonians, we will see um, the basic pattern, which we'll celebrate at the Feast of Trumpets in the uh, very near future. 1 Thessalonians 4. Pick it up in verse 13. 1 Thessalonians 4.13. <clears throat> And this is Paul because they had gotten an earlier letter from him that has not been canonized and they maybe got excited about the incoming sooner. And he said, and I, I understand people wanting Christ's second coming to come as soon as possible. He said, but I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep. He means those that have passed away in Christ. They're asleep, asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again. Even so, God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. Remember, the saints that have passed away in Christ are sleeping. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with the shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump, trumpet of God. And that's what the Feast of Trumpets stands for. It's like, like the cavalry and, you know, and, the, and the commander tells the, the bugler, sound charge. And he puts out his sword and he, you know, da 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 And hopefully they rout the enemy. But it's that, but it's that analogy. Actually, in the book of Revelation, he's pictured as riding a white horse. I wonder, is there a spiritual horse? It doesn't really matter. It may be all figurative language. But the point is, he's coming back at that last trump to take over this world, which sorely needs it. And the dead in Christ will rise first. They're rising. They're not coming down from heaven. They're rising first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds. We're not going anywhere else. We're just in the clouds, in the air. In the atmosphere, thus shall we always be with the Lord. And he wanted them to be comforted by knowing that it's going to happen. If anyone passes away in Christ, they're really blessed and lucky. In their, in their mind, in the next second of their memory, they will wake up and they'll be in God's family and we'll be there with Christ straightening out the world. Um, and and it, if you read Acts 2.29, you'll see that David, one of the greatest prophets in the Bible, got the most ink of anybody in the, in the um, Bible, I think. Acts 2.29, he's still in his grave. Let's go to John 3.13. I'm going to get to the part about why I think it'll be so fulfilling. And you, you can tell me at the Bible study if you agree. John 3.13, uh, Christ says, no one, no one, no one has ascended to heaven. Now think of all the great prophets, you know, Daniel, Noah. Well, we could rattle off a whole ton of saints that have passed away. No one has ascended to heaven, but he who came down from heaven, that is the Son of Man, you know, who's in heaven. So nobody is there. Um, all those great patriarchs are not there. 
Now, I want to tell you the story of my mom's funeral. We were at my mom's funeral since we were in charge. I told the minister at uh, it's a Big Baptist Church, I said, I want you to preach uh, 1 Corinthians 15 about the uh, resurrection. And uh, he did a really good job. You know, he picked the right verses like seed of corn. And then at the, when Christ comes back, they're all resurrected. And they'll be much different than they were before. And it's wonderful. I thought, wow, he's doing a great job. And then he said, uh, my mom was in heaven looking down at this service and smiling. And one of my sons said to me, wait a minute, how can she be in the ground waiting for her change to be resurrected and yet up in heaven looking down at the service? And I remember I said to him, I said, well, we're probably the only people among it's a pretty big crowd, maybe 200, 150, 200. We're probably the only people in this whole building who would even think to ask the question. Nobody else, it's like when it comes to religion, it doesn't have to make sense. Nobody thinks about it. It doesn't have to make sense. And that reminds me of this corny little story called Picture Menu. Uh, this guy says, I stopped at a local uh, Burger King for a cold drink I was reading the menu over the counter, and I noticed a sign to the side of the counter that said, picture menu available. And I had to ask the clerk, what was it for? And she told me there were a number of people who go to that store that can't read, uh, so they decided to have a picture menu available. Of course, I asked, well, how would they know this picture menu was available? And her answer was the classic, well, it says so on the sign, doesn't it? See, she didn't think it through logically. <laughs> they can't. But, but people, as, and, and I'm not talking about any one group. I'm not putting down Baptists or anybody. As far as I can tell, the world as a whole does not expect religion to make sense. And I understand everybody wants to believe their loved ones are in heaven watching all the time. And I, I do understand that. Um, don't worry about your loved ones that passed away. They're in good hands. And God will give them a chance to be in his family in the fairly near future, and God will take good care of them. Um, but what I want to say is the Bible does not contradict itself. And we're not going to go through all the many scriptures we could go through, but enough that we'll see what the pattern is. And if you think you found a scripture that says the opposite, it's probably just a matter of fully understanding it. There's an article in the 21st Century Watch all about it, and uh, he's on like <laughs> six, seven, or eight, and it covers a lot more verses than I will. You can read it so that if you run across one of those verses, you can understand those verses more carefully. The Bible makes sense. It doesn't contradict itself. God is logical and rational. So I want to ask the question, why will we, we be so happy uh, and fulfilled when we're in God's kingdom? I believe people are designed and happiest when they're serving and they're doing what they're able to do. You know, people have different talents and, you know, and that maybe is a, a big subject that they're probably de they don't completely understand yet. Some people are builders and I think they're happiest when they're building. Some people are planners and they plan things like water irrigation systems. And some people are educators and they plan, you know, courses and programs for uh, children and some are nurturers they're good at taking care of the young and I'm, and you can have several different talents I'm not saying you're limited but uh, they go together some are good at putting together musical chorales and programs and they're the happiest when they're doing those programs um, some are protectors uh, and some are leaders and I think they're the happiest when they're doing what they can do I was watching this doctor documentary on FDR and Churchill, and it certainly implied that at their that at their finest moments, when the world was in peril, you know, in a creative sense, they were the happiest. And I remember this statement. It, it, the guy says that the moment Germany declared war on America, he said to his shock, FDR kind of relaxed and got very creative. I think I know what he meant. That before that it was confusing and 
and he was trying to bring America along, but America didn't want to go along, and it was kind of all messy. Once everything was clear, here's your enemy, here's what they want to do, then FDR's ability to plan, and, and same with Churchill, they were actually fulfilled when they were planning. And, they, and he, to give FDR credit, he did a great job of planning and getting things going. Um, I'm not saying everything he did was right, because there are, you, you can't say that about any great man, but he and Churchill did a great job. The point is, I think people are happiest when they're doing what they can do, when they're fulfilled. I want to use a, a, um, a hound dog as an example. And I've seen this with many hound dogs. When they get them ready, and they're ready to go chase some rabbits, the dog's tail is just wagging, wagging, wagging. He's so happy, he wants to run and chase that hound dog. I mean, I mean, in that sense, that's what the dog has been bred for. And other dogs are bred for other things, you know, bloodhounds and police dogs, the whole bunch, and some are for finding dead bodies. But the dog wants to serve. He wants to do what he can do. If, if he's supposed to herd sheep, you know, they say even when they're little young puppies, they love running around trying to redirect a herd of sheep because that's what they're supposed to do. I think that's true of people. When God tells us, okay, now you're in my family, you've now got the power and the authority to straighten out things. Right now, just from talking to young people and others, the atmosphere in this country is anti-family. I could get into details of things, but I'll, I won't, I'll spare you gruesome details, you, you know a lot of them myself. It's like what's on television, what's in the movies, the kind of decisions the courts have made for the last 20 some years. They've, like one young man said, well, why get married? In other words, and, and then a lot of places it's illegal to spank kids. You could almost, and there, there's, some people want this bill where children can sue their parents. Can you imagine how bad it is. Well, when we get in charge, and I believe uh, this is an opinion, obviously God will do whatever he will do, but I believe God won't make all the decisions. He'll make you know, basic directional signals and of course make us behave if we make stupid, something stupid, but I think he'll let us make a lot of the decisions. And we'll be fulfilled because we will set an atmosphere for families that run their own farms and ranches and workshops and, and teach them how to do stuff. And it'll be wonderful. And, and by the way, when you're a spirit being, if I understand this correctly, you won't have to eat, you won't have to sleep. You can be busy doing stuff all the time and watching people. And I assume you can travel all over the place quickly. You know, they won't be able to get away with a lot of stuff. You know what I mean? It'll be, it'll be, I mean, that, that scripture where, where the, the teacher suddenly appears behind him and says, this is the way, walk you in it, you know, Isaiah 66. Well, you get the idea. I think we will be fulfilled because we will be accomplishing something. We'll be doing something. Let me go through these scriptures real quickly. Um, I'm not going to read, but Matthew 5, 5 says, we shall inherit the earth. And this earth is in bad shape. Uh, I think in some places the air is bad, but, but there are a lot of bad things. Let's go to Revelation um, 2.26. Remember, the Bible does not contradict itself. Revelation 2.26. And he who overcomes and keeps my works until the end. Those stay faithful to God until either you pass away or Christ comes back. To him will I give power, power over the nations. He shall rule them with a rod of iron. In other words, they're going to have to behave. Do you realize that if you looked at this world right now, um, there are some religions that really, they're really, I really feel sorry for their people. It's kind of a master-slave relationship. They suppress women. They do a lot of bad things. You really can't straighten out those countries unless you get that religion out and give them the true religion. I mean, you just can't do it. Um, I, I was listening to this, they were talking about this um, scandal where a major Christian church charity gave $50 million to Gaza 
and the money went, because people in charge of Gaza are Hamas. Well, you know where that money went. It went for terrorism. And now they're backing down. Well, we didn't know. And, you know, well, maybe that's another debate. Um, Revelation 3.21, whether they knew or not. To him who overcomes will I grant to sit with me on my throne. I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. Revelation 5, 9, and 10. Um, I'll read just verse 10. And he made us kings and priests to our God, and we shall reign. That means rule on the earth. Rule on the earth. And we will have, I guess, sub-thrones, whatever the appropriate title is. Obviously, we'll be working under people like David and Daniel and, well, probably a whole host of other great men, some of whom we don't even know, who were great saints in that first, second, and third centuries. Uh, but together, obviously under the leadership of Jesus Christ, we're going to turn this world into a paradise, a physical paradise first. Uh, we'll solve problems, and I honestly believe we'll be happy solving problems, accomplishing stuff, uh, using the talents God gave us. And of course, God will give us more talents once we're a spirit being. But I believe even now, everybody has a talent for nurturing, leading. Um, and we'll have, one, we'll have something that Christ has also. We'll remember what it's like to be human, what it's like to be weak, what it's like to be scared. Because, you know, we're just like, while well, we were just like all the people we'll be ruling. I mean, we'll understand what it's like to be human. And we'll also remember how badly things are screwed up now. And I think we'll be happy and fulfilled, just like the dog that's wagging his tail as he gets ready to chase the rabbit. Um, so what does God say he expects from us? Let's go to 2 Peter. We're going to look at what God expects from us before he puts us in that position. Um, and 2 Peter 3 2 Peter 3. It's not that we're earning our salvation. I know that gets to be tricky. We're not earning our salvation, but God does have some expectations for us. Um, 2 Peter 3, verse 16. As also in all his epistles, speaking in them of things that, which some things are hard to be under, understand, it is easy to misunderstand Paul and some of the other uh, parts of the Bible which the untaught and unstable, and a lot of unstable people run around with Bibles, or people who don't understand, you know, you can't understand the New Testament if you don't understand the Old, because most of it's a reference or quotes of the Old. Twist to their own destruction, as they do also the rest of scriptures. You therefore, beloved, since you know this beforehand, um, beware lest you fall from your own steadfastness, being led away with the error of the wicked. So what we have to do is stay steadfast and not be led astray. But notice verse 18. We have to not be led astray, but also, but grow in grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We have to build that relationship with Jesus Christ and grow. It's not so much that we're doing it. It's like Kelly says. He had a nice way of saying it. You kind of get yourself out of the way as best you can, and let God's spirit flow through you. I like that analogy. Kind of let God work in us. I mean, he's not going to force us, but work in us so we will grow. And so we will become a mature Christian. But grow in grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior. To him be glory, both now and forever. So we have to do th two things. We have to grow and not be led astray. The one thing that God does do, you'll see it in the Bible, God will test people. Like he tested the Israelites, 10 tests, and they failed every one. That's why they didn't go in the promised land. God will allow somebody to come along who's maybe charismatic, clever, and lead you back into the world, or whichever, whatever. There's some other errors out there, too. We have to remain faithful to God. Um, and also, I think, the man of sin who's coming in the future is going to have a lot of charisma. And he's going to deceive this world where the Bible becomes secondary to this great dictator 
whatever his title is, the king of kings, probably whatever his title will be, where people end up worshiping him. He's going to lead a lot of people astray. We have to resist that because we're prepared, so we should be able to handle it. Um, Luke um, 19, the same analogy with a few more details in Matthew 25 as well. But Luke 19, 16. Luke 19, 16 reads, Then um, came the first, saying, Master, your um, money has earned over ten times. He said, Well done, your good and, and servant. Because you've been faithful to very little, have authority over ten cities. Um, and I think that parable is true. If we can just be faithful with what God has given us now, can we help God's church? Can we encourage others? Can we get our human nature out of the way as much as you can so we can grow? How would you like to someday, when Christ comes back, say, I'll put you in charge of Chicago. <laughs> Strap on your guns. I'm just kidding. <laughs> and that would be a challenge now, wouldn't it? You all said, I want that job, right? <laughs> or maybe just part of Chicago. Never mind, the worst part, I think. I guess I better stay out of trouble. Um, and if you went to Romans 8, 16 to 23, it says the earth is waiting for the sons of God. One more corny story called Uncomfortable. During a test this man administered, I noticed that, he's a professor, I noticed that one of my marriage students who was quite pregnant kept rubbing her sides like this. And so after class, he asked her, was she all right? Were you okay? She said, oh, I'm fine. It's just that my baby was turned sideways and was kicking my ribs, just really kicking them and kicking them. But I'm okay. He said, well, that's good. He says, usually when you start speaking, he goes to sleep. <laughs> I know the feeling, right? <laughs> Actually, there were certain sermons we had on tape, and we turn on the ignition and put them on, and my son, one of my sons would go to sleep immediately. <laughs> uh, he learned to sleep doing sermons. It kept the sub a lot of problems. <laughs> well, I put that sermon in mean there. If we were to do what, what some people think, we'd be bored like the baby and that lady. You know, there's a church, or the biggest church, and it says the reward of the saved is to eternally sit there and watch the beatific vision. The way they described it, it sounds boring. Boring. You sit there and you watch the beatific vision for all eternity. I'm not against watching God and be inspired by his presence. I'm not saying that. But I think having something to do and to accomplish to plan and execute will make us much happier. We'll have power lawful authority, and we will get things done. In John 14, 23, talks, Christ told his disciples to be encouraged. God had many mansions or offices or rooms in his mansion. Uh, and I want to go to Revelation 21, give you my idea what I think those rooms and things were. Revelation 21, verse 1 through 3. And that's called the city four square, where God's um, throne in heaven is actually coming to earth. Not only are we not going up there, God is coming down here. Um, Revelation 21. Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, new Jerusalem, coming down from heaven, from God, prepare like a bride adorned for a husband. And if you read all the details, it's like almost a 1,500 cube, which obviously the earth wouldn't, on its natural thing as it is now, wouldn't work. It'd be all wobbly, but God, of course, will straighten that out. Now, if you think of that as a gigantic throne of God, miles and miles of offices and suites, and there will be a place for everybody. You can put a whole lot of spirit beings in that office. If we're in this first resurrection, we'll probably be on the second or third floor, closer to 
to Christ and God the Father, and he'll be the sun, bright and beaming. And then I think the spiritual world and the physical world will be combined into one. But whether that's true or not doesn't matter. Um, and I'm sure whatever God has planned for the future will be part of it. It'll be a great thing, a great thing. But we will have a place, an office there, with your little name on the door, just like if someone gave you an office in the White House with a new administration, you'd be, you know, if you were into that sort of thing, you'd be really happy. We'll have that in the future. Uh, all we have to do to get that office is stay humble, grow, let God, through his spirit, help us grow in grace and knowledge, and not be led astray until the second coming of Jesus Christ or our passing away.